there, there clearly is a need for an inquiry and it's an urgent need because the pandemic uh, hasn't gone away it's still with us and we may be facing further waves and new variants nobody can predict the future and clearly we didn't handle it as well as some other countries and we need to learn lessons from the best so we need an inquiry that benchmarks us against countries that appear to manage it better and countries of equivalent wealth and resource um but we also need to hear the story so there's an, an there are various elements of a, a public inquiry or any inquiry. One is straightforward, who knew what and when, what did they do, what was the consequence, the sort of the legalistic narrative. Uh, but also you need to bear witness to the stories. There's a phenomenal amount of suffering and grief and harm that has gone on that we need to acknowledge. And that's an important part of an inquiry as well. So the, the People's Inquiry is doing that, I think very importantly, because any one of the videos that you watch will ring bells with people because the extent of loss and harm and not just from COVID, way beyond COVID has been so great. Uh, and I don't think we can quite get our heads around it. And politically, you can understand why the government wants to move on. The one good call it made was to invest early in vaccine development. It's as procured, luckily procured vaccines that work. And of course the NHS has been fundamental to its rollout. But then that doesn't mean that we should forget what happened um, the year before that. Um, and you know, politically, you can see why they want to do that. And the history of public inquiries actually is to wait for the next administration to come in. So I broke the story of the Bristol Heart scandal in 1992. It took seven years to get a public inquiry. I gave evidence in 2000, so eight years after I'd broken the story, when Labour had come in and was then able to blame it all on the Conservatives. The Mid Staffordshire scandal then unfolded and uh, the Tories ordered the public inquiry so they could blame Labour. So it's often used public inquiries as political point scoring. But after Hillsborough, uh, we had a rapid public inquiry because we needed to make Stadia safe for the next season. So we did like an interim inquiry. So this is what we need to learn for the next football season or the next flu season with this. And, and the rest of it can take a bit longer to come out. So I see it as something, you know, there are urgent things we need to do. Do we really have the right PPE? Does our PPE work? Uh, do we know that health and care workers died probably having picked up infections at, uh, at work when that was possibly avoidable? Now, how can we protect care homes better? These things need to be answered before we get another wave. So what's really interesting about writing in real time and having all the documentation and conversations is that there is no room for Hindsight. Um, although I've been writing for Private Eye about shortcomings in the NHS and social care system, you know, for 30 years, and particularly health inequalities, uh, from my own emails and conversations, I was quite optimistic at the beginning. Uh, I, we didn't know at that stage that perhaps China had delayed reporting of the original viral outbreak and perhaps breached international law. That's something that needs to be looked at. But the World Health Organization announced this outbreak in maybe January the 4th. Yeah, and within a week, we had the entire viral genome had been released by China. So the whole genome had been unraveled. And immediately, a week after the announcement, we could start working on vaccines and tests. And then three days after that, a German laboratory actually produced a test. And I can remember talking to other NHS workers, consultants and experts, and they were incredibly excited by that. So they said, so even if it does turn out to be an unpleasant SARS virus, we now have the testing. Uh, we can do the basics of uh, infection control that stopped the SARS outbreak in 2002 and 3, and I'm pretty confident there won't be uh, a pandemic. So I bought into that mindset in January. Interestingly, my wife, Jo, who's a GP, said, I think you're being too complacent. I think there's much we don't understand about this. It was Jo who went out and bought hand sanitizer and masks for the Hammond family while I was still being a bit glib. And it is interesting, perhaps, that the countries that managed it best more likely had women as leaders, um, but also were scarred from SARS in 2002 and 2003. So they understood about the Chinese cover-up previously. They didn't really trust anything coming out of Beijing. And they, they adopted the precautionary principle early on. We don't know much about this virus. Let's assume it could be really unpleasant. So let's close our borders uh, and implement isolation and testing. Um, and in that instance, it turned out to be right. Um, from the UK's point of view, could we have done that? Well, we're 14 times the population size of New Zealand and far busier trade routes. And, and retrospectively, we now know over probably the February half term holidays, there'd been a thousand seedings, more than that, of this virus all over the UK before we were anywhere near it. So it was all over the place. 
So perhaps the world could only have stopped it if China had fezzed up immediately. The World Health Organization had said, let's do travel restrictions, because let's remember they didn't uh, say it was a, a highest concern until January the 30th, and they weren't advising travel restrictions much before that. So I think there's lessons for the whole world to learn. Uh, and then there's lessons um, for the UK. And actually, as a journalist at Private Eye, I've tried not to be to blame me because obviously I called it wrong in the first place. I didn't think there'd be a pandemic, but I, I certainly think that we were complacent. It's always puzzled me that you can be a health secretary without having any expertise in health or an education secretary without having expertise in education. So, I, you know, I don't think at the top we had people who really understood the problem. Uh, and then the, the fact that so many public health experts were saying at the time, we're locking down too late, we haven't acted quickly enough. And they later felt they had to form an organization called Independent Sage uh, as a, as a pub bait to educate the public, but also to give a different view than the official guidance suggests there've been huge issues amongst, you know, what following the science means. And that's been fascinating to see that unravel as a journalist uh, but I don't think it was the benefit of hindsight. There are plenty of public health experts, uh, uh, Professor Devi Sridhar in, uh, obviously in Edinburgh, and John Ashton, very experienced public health expert, was saying right at the start, uh, we need to adopt the precautionary principle and do this. So I wonder where that voice went. Uh, and you can understand why that we've just got Brexit done, whatever that means. We want to open up the UK as a free trade area. The last thing Boris Johnson wanted to do was border controls, travel restrictions, uh, perhaps uh, import restrictions. He was, his wife was pregnant, oh, his partner was pregnant. He was having another baby. He didn't go to the first COBRA meeting. So you can see it's almost like a Greek tragedy. And that's what I found with public inquiries. When they actually do the timeline, it sort of unfolds like a Greek tragedy. You can see early on where it could have been stopped. So all the way back to the, the, the whistleblowing ophthalmologist in China who blew the whistle on this virus was shut up and silenced. Uh, if we'd listened to him, we could have done this. If we'd done that, we could have done that. Um, so I think it, uh, there's, a, there's an old saying that outbreaks are inevitable, but pandemics are, are preventable or optional and, and I think when we look at the timeline of this, there were certain things that we could have done in a different way at a certain time that perhaps could have either stopped the pandemic, but certainly greatly curtailed the number of deaths. Well, it's hard, isn't it? Because we know that the countries at the very beginning that adopted the precautionary principle at the outset uh, did best. The EU could claim it's adopting the precautionary principle by suspending the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine or questioning it, but more likely there are certain political motives and you have to balance risks on both sides. In the middle of a third wave, far more people are likely to die from COVID if they refuse to have the AstraZeneca vaccine, which may uh, or may not cause a tiny increase in a certain rare type of blood clot, probably doesn't. So it's really interesting how risk averse countries are going to be. The, the UK instinct is to open up but we've been bitten three times with three lockdowns. Uh, I think we will be more cautious, uh, but the history of viruses is that they tend to win, particularly the ones that are embedded and have spread. I, it's gonna be really hard. We can talk about zero COVID and trying to eliminate it. I think that will be extremely difficult. Uh, and a bit like a flu virus or cold coronaviruses, it will embed and it will probably remain a seasonal offering now because it's all over the world and will continue to mutate and vary. Um, and alarmingly, for example, the South African variant doesn't seem to uh, respond to the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine um, or the, the vaccine doesn't seem to stop it. So clearly there are ongoing risks at the border and we need to figure out ways of managing that. And I, I mean, I'm not going abroad this summer, put it like that, and I'm not going abroad probably this year, um, but the UK public probably won't tolerate border control much beyond perhaps into next year. And that's really stretching it. So. I don't think the risk is ever going to go away. The good news, I guess, is the vaccines can be adapted because that technology means that if there is a change to the spike protein in a variant, you can adapt the vaccine. But then how do you ensure safety? Are we able to just rush through a new batch without doing further trials? Or is it significant enough change to need a trial? So that's an issue too. Uh, international law is interesting because the international law says if you have a variant of concern, you have to fess up to it immediately otherwise you're breaking the law. Well, did we, whether the Kent variant arose in Kent or not, did we fez up to it early enough? Because 
in Europe, they're complaining about us not exporting any vaccines. Well, we've ex certainly exported the Kent variant, and that's the predominant variant in Europe at the moment. So immediately we pick up one of these variants and it appears to be of concern because of changes to the spike protein or whatever, we need to be on it. And in the vaccine labs, they need to be working out a way of defeating it if the current vaccines don't work. So I think science will mean that there'll be far fewer deaths in future, but there's something, they call it the red queen hypothesis, which means that we're, we're always slightly behind the curve because the virus mutates so quickly, we're always playing catch up. And so I also think although science will reduce deaths and harm, I don't think we're going to get rid of it and we will be living with it and there will be further outbreaks and deaths, sadly. So uh, I guess the flip side is we live with risk all the time. There are lots of people, there are millions of people who die prematurely right across the globe from the diseases that are preventable with decent standards of public health and health care. So we shouldn't just focus on COVID, we should focus on air pollution heart disease, ultra processed food, uh, smoking, alcohol, drugs, all the things we're really bored of talking about in terms of overall premature death toll, probably far more than COVID. 60 million people died last year, two and a half, three million of COVID. Now, obviously death happens, but quite a few million deaths could have been avoided and lives prolonged if everybody had a decent standard of healthcare and public health. And that was actually the original vision of the World Health Organization back in 1975. Now they promised health for all by the year 2000 and in 1978 uh, all, all the member states signed up for that and weren't able to deliver it but I think we need to refocus on that we've learned that health is connected that no risk is an island and not just infectious disease we need to really focus on things like uh, global warming and making sure people have decent standards of primary care clean water etc globally because these are precisely the environments where new infections uh, will flourish. Uh, so yeah, a big focus on global health, but what was interesting is the countries were pretty much left alone to do it. The World Health Organization said this is what you want to do, but actually countries were left alone to come up with their own plan and that hasn't been coordinated and it's been all over the place. Can we really trust China in the future? Can the world work together with threats of bioweapons and cybersecurity and all the rest of it that's you know these are big questions but actually to fight a pandemic you need a global response so you need people not just to contribute to the world health organization but take notice of what it says uh, in real time and we really didn't do that and and that would be one of the keys to stopping it in the future i think it's interesting isn't it boris johnson is now arguing that capitalism and greed was what got vaccines over the line but you know we paid 10 times over the odds for PPE, for example, from all sorts of people, much of it was useless. Uh, and uh, so just throwing money at something, I, we weren't just lucky with vaccines. I think the experts that we put in charge of procurement in the task force knew a bit about vaccines. So I think that was a key issue. So it's not just about greed and capitalism throwing money at it. I, you know, whatever you think of Dido Harding, She's not a public health expert, so I wouldn't necessarily expect her to come up with a brilliant response to test and trace or whatever. So that's, you know, you, clearly it's, you need the right people in charge. Um, and I think we realised in this country, the government realised that its, it's pre-vaccine handling had been so poor that it better pull something out of the bag. And that's maybe why we paid top dollar for the vaccines. We have paid a lot of money. I feel really sorry for the Oxford AstraZeneca project because obviously Producing a vaccine at cost price uh, means that the company has lost a lot of money, but we know that if we just charged a huge amount for vaccines and made it a profit making venture, yes, we would produce vaccines for the rich world, we wouldn't be able to uh, churn them out in poorer countries. So it's absolutely fundamental we support the Oxford AstraZeneca project, but then its share price has plummeted and partly because it keeps being slighted by world leaders who don't really understand what they're talking about, possibly for political reasons. So that's my worry is I was really excited at the beginning of this, that here was a vaccine program that was entirely ethical, that was gonna produce these vaccines at, at cost price at three quid a shot when other companies were charging 20 quid or 30 quid. Uh, and I don't know how long that's gonna last. I think the company and its shareholders will say, look, we did this thing and we're just being slated left, right and center and we're gonna start upping our prices. Um, and so, yeah, it was, a, it was a mixed response. We've done well on vaccines, but vaccines aren't the only answer. Having a vaccine won't reverse health inequalities. And it is interesting when you talk to people who are high risk, who don't want to have a vaccine and you think, are you mad? And you talk to them and they say, well, 
the state and the government has never cared about my health for the last 20, 30 years. And now they're coming along with a vaccine saying this is just for you. And I'm deeply suspicious. And I can really understand that viewpoint. If you've been, you know, the, the, the rich in this country live 10 years longer than the poor and the poor have 20 more years of chronic disease to live with. And if you've been living in horrible housing conditions with no money, with a chronic disease, and then somebody pops up and says, you're special, we're giving you a vaccine. I can understand the skepticism. So the vaccines won't reverse that. And it, what's really interesting, I think, is that the, even the rich countries, the rich countries that have suffered most are the ones with high health inequalities. So both the virus and the means we put in place to tackle the virus has predominantly harmed the poor. Uh, and it's pretty disgraceful that a rich country like the UK has such high levels of income inequality and health inequality. And pretty much all this virus has done is shine a light on that. It's compressed a whole year's worth of death uh, risk into a few weeks. So the people who are high at risk of death from COVID are at higher risk of death from other things as well, uh, usually because they're poor or have other health conditions. So uh, it would be very foolish of Boris Johnson to try and pretend that the jab was a road to freedom and that's all we needed to uh, reverse uh, our problems because the problems are far more deep seated. I guess my particular interest is, is how we communicate science. I don't have any expertise in infectious disease as people who've read my private eye columns will realize I made mistakes at the beginning but my particular interest is how we communicate risk to me that has been fascinating and it really matters um, so how can we do that better because the, the countries that did well yes they acted early but actually crucial to that was the population buying into the leadership and trusting in their leadership so what is it that's you know I know New Zealand is a smaller country, but they, the New Zealanders, I know because I'm half Australian, they don't like being told what to do, but they bought in the, to the communication style and skills and honesty and integrity of uh, Jacinda Ardern. How was that managed? Um, the thing that amazed me about all this is the flip-flopping of Boris Johnston. And you remember at the beginning and he was all eh, bullish and this is fine. And I've been around NHS hospitals and I was shaking everyone's hand. And then he looks as, as, you know, Knight of the Waking Dead. I mean, geez, yeah, he nearly died from this. He paid for his risk-taking behaviour by nearly with his own life. But it's really hard if you're watching that to see this flip-flopping between the, the one Boris and the other Boris, and it, it doesn't look authentic. So I guess, how do you get authentic, trusted communication uh, that weighs out all the risks? So. I've read a lot of vaccine skepticism blogs and, and, and lockdown skepticism blogs, and I don't mind that. And to me, skepticism is about challenging established wisdoms and looking for gaps in the evidence. What skepticism isn't is refusing to admit error. So the skeptics that pretend to be skeptics, but actually dogmatically say, this is what we, would have, we should do and stick to that is uh, madness. But it's fine, it's fine to keep challenging. It's fine to keep asking questions. So, at the very beginning, we should have been honest and said, look, we're going to do this. And we're going to lock down. These are the harms we think it will have on the economy, on families, on children's education. And this is how we're going to mitigate those harms. And we did get a bit better. We got better online learning and education for kids at home, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, to, to win over an argument, it's not just about this is what we're going to do, is you have to accept that there are risks and benefits and there are unknowns. And you just need to be honest about them. And uh, I think the communication has been a bit all over the place. So that's the, that's the key for this inquiry. How could we have communicated risk better in a way that would have um, mitigated harms? And it would have been, we'll never know, but if Boris Johnson has said in February, this could be really unpleasant, we're closing our borders, uh, would have been interesting to see how the Daily Mail and the, the other newspapers, so as someone who works in the media, what, were the, what was the media's role in all this? You know, it's all very well just lining up the politicians and the advisors against the wall and shooting them. Actually, the media and social media had a big role to play in that. And the, my overarching message, I guess, is that we all could have done stuff better. The NHS was marvellous in lots of things, but we've also made mistakes. There have been massive, maybe 40, 50, 60,000 people actually picked up COVID infection whilst in hospital. Either that means the PPE doesn't work, our infection control measures doesn't work. Yes, you can clap the carers, but actually, you know, let's all accept part of the responsibility ourselves. We have responsibility for our own health as much as we can. We have responsibility for helping our friends and family and community to be healthier. Uh, and we all could have done probably a bit better with COVID. So I think we can all say that, but let's not forget the government is ultimately accountable for its response. 
Uh, it did its Operation Cygnus, it shelved it, it didn't fund it, and it missed the best chance we had of, of stopping this at the outset. So it's fair enough to uh, put those in authority in the spotlight, but I think also you ask the question of yourself, what would I have done if I was in that situation? Uh, and generally that puts you in a slightly more balanced mindset. I think people never realize this, how fast exponential growth is. That was, the, you know, I, I remember it from my medical school days, but sometimes you can't really predict a babe, but when a virus wave takes off, it's always much quicker than you think. Mm. And always in retrospect, you say, we should have locked down a week or so earlier. And it's, you know, so who knows what data they were looking at and what the debates were going on inside, but uh, that, that all needs to be made available, I think, so people understand, you know, it's, uh, what was the evidence on which you were making your lockdown decisions, etc. all needs to come out.